Good morning. Happy Easter to you. It's good to see you all here. Welcome to Holland Park Prez. Glad that you've chosen to come here and join us as we worship our risen Savior. It's a great day to celebrate what God has done for us by raising his son from the dead and where we can experience the blessings, the promises of Christ because he conquered sin and death for us. For that, we are glad to be here and worship with you. If you're worshiping with us online, glad that you've chosen to tune in today. Welcome. I want to call your attention to a number of things going on in the life of the church. Here at Holland Park Press, we want everyone to have a chance to be connected, to worship, and to serve. So I invite you to look through the worship guide, which you should have, and call your attention to one special thing going on in the very near future. we got Explore the Alpha class. It's coming up. If you have questions about anything about the Christian faith, I invite you, please, Consider being a part of Alpha that starts in the early next month in May. So consider being a part of that. Now, let me invite you, please stand and let's join together in a responsive call to worship with our Easter litany found on the inside of Worship Guide. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Shout hallelujah, for death has been swallowed up in life. Hallelujah, Christ is risen.
You may be seated. A reading of Mark's account from that very first Easter morning. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, that which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What a beautiful reality that we get to come together and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Every year on Easter, our offering is given beyond these walls to, give re to bring resurrection hope to those who need it most. And this year, for many of us, we have been watching and praying as we see the scenes of war unfold in the country of Ukraine. One of our mission partners, Convoy of Hope, has been on the front lines, on the ground in Ukraine, providing tangible relief to some of the most vulnerable in this war-torn country. In fact, let's watch this together. О, саме більше це миру потребує, але його на даний час немає. Потребує все, і ліки, і продукти, і піклування. Тому що війна, як кожному народу, незалежно від міста чи національності, приносить проблеми, біду, плач, біль. Every dollar given will go directly to our key partners in Ukraine and the surrounding areas. So far, we have already given $100,000 to support the disaster relief and efforts in this area. And we're praying this bold, crazy prayer that we might double that number today on that Easter Sunday. We believe God. We believe in crazy, generous things. We, th we thank you for the generosity of this church. You can give online through texting or online or the offering boxes that you'll see at the end of our gathering. Thank you for being such a generous people in church. And now we'll continue in worship by being led in prayer by will. Let us pray. Father God, on this most holy day to us, we gather to remember, rejoice, and give thanks. 
Throughout this Easter service, help us to remember the loving sacrificial act your son did on our behalf, dying so that we may have access to eternal life. Keep that fact in the forefronts of our minds and give us the wisdom to rejoice. Help us to delight in your lavish expression of love today. Give us the good judgments to say thank you. We thank you despite missing a loved one this Easter. Lord, we thank you despite family drama and disappointment. Lord, we thank you despite struggles in physical or mental health, financial stress, or whatever else we may find that displeases us. We thank you, Lord, because we know that despite what is happening to us now, if we know you and we know your son as our Lord and Savior, we have a hope and a future for that, for the, for the hope. We have a hope and a future, and for that, Lord, we say thank you. Not only do we say thank you, Lord, but we need your help to live in ways that demonstrate our gratitude. A gratitude that lives according to what you say in your word and not according to what we see in our world. We, say, we see in our world, and we, in, in our world, Lord, Lord, we see good children in terrible situations. We see terror on subways. In our world, we see grave injustice at home and abroad. Lord, we pray for the hungry and the homeless in our city. And we pray for the millions of hungers, ho homeless and hungry in the Ukraine. They're experiencing unimaginable injustice. Give us the will to act justly do mercy, and walk humbly with you as we respond to the atrocities we see. Lord, we thank you for your son and the resurrection power he has given us. Help us to use that resurrection power to raise the hope of others. We pray all this with great gratitude in the name of the risen Lord Jesus the Christ and all God's children say, amen. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen.
As you continue to stand, let us affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it is so good to celebrate with you this Resurrection Sunday, whether you're here in the sanctuary or joining us from Elliott Hall uh, or online from wherever you are. Special welcome if this is your first time in this church. Uh, maybe you were dragged here by family or uh, a significant other. I know that to be true for some of you uh, because some of you have said to me, Brian, I'm bringing so-and-so to church on Easter, which is another way of saying, so just don't blow it, Pastor. We started this morning with those sacred words that have been passed down as a kind of Easter anthem from one generation to the next. He is risen indeed. One Easter morning, his dad walked down into the kitchen and he said, boy, am I hungry. And his six-year-old son looked up from the kitchen counter where he was sitting and he said, I am hungry indeed. <laughs> and this dad said, wait a second, are you making fun of what we say in church? And he said, no, daddy, but our Sunday school teacher said if you feel something really big, you got to say indeed. <laughs> so we are indeed honored, so just grateful that you are here to celebrate this Easter with us, to celebrate that death is defeated, sins are forgiven, hope wins, hell loses because Christ is risen indeed. But see, before we get to the hope and the, the, the joy of the resurrection, first we got to deal with this other emotion that is really front and center in that Easter story that we heard read for us earlier. We're told by the uh, gospel writer Mark that, that uh, these three women, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary the mother of James, and a woman named Salome, these three women went to the tomb very early on the first day of the week. Now, this is one of those details that, you know, it's easy to sort of skim over because we really want to get to the meat of the story. Very early, dark 30, as Grandpa used to say. So Mark drops this little detail, and you're like, well, thank you so much, uh, Mark, for letting us know that, you know, the Marys and, and Sal were morning people and just kind of early risers and fully caffeinated and go-getters, and they just wanted to get an early start on their day as they went to the tomb, and, and kind of like everybody who went to the sunrise service this morning. Is that what this is all about? No. They're headed to the tomb very early at daybreak because they're afraid they might get caught, afraid that someone might see them anointing the body of a, of a condemned criminal because that's wh who Jesus was. He was convicted of inciting rebellion, an insurrectionist. So these women were justifiably concerned and afraid of being connected to that. But then if you keep peeling back the layers of this text, it's a story loaded with fear, beginning with the fear that always surrounds death, right? the death of someone they loved, someone they'd pledged their loyalty and their lives to, and now he's in a grave. But then second, there's suffering and the fear that comes with suffering. Mark tells us that they were bringing with them spices to anoint Jesus' body. So they're not just like going to the columbarium to pay their respects. This was a a, a deeply sacred Jewish ritual where they would go to the tomb and they would unwrap the burial linens and anoint the actual corpse, a body that no doubt bore the scars of all the torture and the crucifixion and the reminders of how he had suffered. That's what they're expecting to encounter in that tomb, death, suffering. And then think about, third, the failure that these women expected to find in that tomb. Right, just days after Jesus rode into Jerusalem being lauded like he was a king and now he's six feet under 
which means their hopes had failed. He had failed. Even his followers had failed him running away when he needed them most. Everyone, by the way, except for the women. Death, suffering, failure, and fourth, they certainly would have expected to find shame. Crucifixion was the most shameful way to die. It was reserved for slaves and, and the worst of those on, on the death row criminals. Right? Think about that. To be put on display as you're breathing your last. And here was their friend, the one that they thought was their savior, their king, the one who would make everything that was wrong in the world right again, and now he's crucified in shame. Death, suffering, failure, shame, all these fears they expected to find in that graveyard. And are these not four of the greatest and deepest fears that we deal with as well? Starting, of course, with death. That's an easy one. No one likes to think about death, talk about death, acknowledge death, because we're all afraid of it. There was a recent article in the New York Times that uh, talked about this growing phenomenon and the interest in the cryogenics industry. Anybody heard about this? It's kind of creepy. It's where they freeze your body when you die so that, you know, if 100 years later they finally invent a way to bring you back to life, you'll be able to keep on living. And people pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for this, which seems kind of steep to me, right? Like Han Solo didn't have to pay a dime for that, but, you know, people are doing this. And that's our culture. We're afraid of death. But then we're also afraid of suffering. We will do anything to avoid pain. You see this all over the place. We spend so much, trying to, so much time trying to avoid pain through, through alcohol, medication, addictions, entertainment, buying more stuff, racking up more achievements, anything to dull the pain because we hate suffering. Or maybe it's the, the pain that you see or the fear surrounding someone who's going through a painful bout with an illness or cancer or someone who's holding on for life and, and they're not getting any better. Then think about failure. So many of you, if you're anything, if you're wired at all like me, what drives you to keep on trying to succeed in life is this constant fear of failing. We're afraid of, of failing other people or failing ourselves or people's expectations of us. We're afraid that we'll be a failure in God's eyes. Death, suffering, failure, and then shame. And shame is, is an, under, it's an underrated emotion. Last week, I was flying somewhere with Allie, and I don't know if this has ever you know, happened to you or you've ever heard this before, but one of the things that they tell you to do when you're traveling by air is to drink a lot of water before you get on the plane because you can get dehydrated when you're flying. So that morning, we had an early flight, and I drank like you know, two Nalgene's full of water before we went to the airport. And uh, just to be on the safe side, and then I had my venti Starbucks at the airport. So um, we get on the plane, and about half an hour into the plane, I- I've got to go, like now. But we basically just, you know, took off, and we're still going up, and the seatbelt sign is still on, and, and they're pretty serious about that stuff these days. And so I'm sitting there, and I am sweating, in part because I'm fully hydrated, but um, I need a restroom. Well, finally, the captain comes on and he talks for like six minutes, you know, and he's just uh, the weather and all this kind of stuff, which they do sometimes. Um, Then eventually, after his uh, little, you know, soliloquy or whatever, he turns off the seatbelt sign, and before that, boom, goes on, I am up and out of my seat, seatbelt's off, I'm ready to make a beeline to the bathroom. Of course, in that moment, what happens every time you ever want to go to the restroom on an airplane? The drink carts come out (laughs) for half an hour. Right? And the drink card happens to be between me and the restroom in the back of the plane. Well, I'm not going to last that long. And so finally, I just decide I'm going to make a run for it. I know that I'm not supposed to, but this is DEFCON 3 bladder crisis moment at this point. So instead of waiting for the drink card to pass by so I can go to the, you know, restrooms in the back, I decided to walk through the curtain. (laughs) You know, right? The curtain separating all of us lowly people in coach from the holy of holies that is first class. <laughs> and I know I'm not supposed to, but I'm desperate at this point. So I try to play it cool as I'm walking, like I'm not really in a rush, and I know what I'm doing, and I look like I belong in 2A. <laughs> but as soon as I step through that curtain, I kid you not, this flight attendant stops right in front of me, and she says loud enough for everybody in first class to hear, oh, no, sir, you can't do that. 
And she goes on to tell me, right, that I am required by law, not just any law, federal law, to use the restroom in my cabin of service. Thank you very much. And everybody in first class is like nodding their heads <laughs> as they look at me like busted, man. Don't be stealing our lavender-infused towelettes. <laughs> so then I have to make the long walk of shame back to my seat in the middle of the plane. Shame is a powerful emotion. Um, after the 9.30 service, somebody did come up to me and they said, were you on so-and-so airline? Because I am the chief of flight attendant training for that airline. And I need to know who this flight attendant was. And I was like, I'm saving that for next time. But so often I'm controlled by shame, a fear of what people might think, embarrassment. We live in the fear that someday people are actually going to see us for who we really are and they're not going to like it. We're ashamed of our past mistakes we've made, regrets, the shame of a, a relationship that we couldn't make work, or a divorce, or an addiction that we're afraid to share with the people we love. Death, suffering, failure, shame, four of our biggest fears. So here's kind of the Easter question for every one of us today. When these three women came to that tomb on that first Easter morning, what did they find? Right, they expected to find all this fear, but what did they find inside that tomb? Nothing. An angel says to them, he is not here. See the place where they laid him. And what do they see? Nothing. No death, no suffering, no failure, no shame. The tomb was empty. The resurrection of Jesus conquered our deepest fears, and that is good news for you and me. And by the way, it isn't good news unless it's really true. Maybe some of you walked into this place with questions. And if you're being honest, you're kind of skeptical that Easter is really anything more than just this sentimental story we keep telling ourselves. Maybe one of the reasons you're not so sure about all this is you've kind of gotten, I don't know, disillusioned by the church or the things that church people tend to say. That's why next week we're starting a new series called, Did God Really Say That? And these are things that we think are in the Bible that aren't actually in the Bible. So if you've ever been listening in on a conversation and you heard someone say, well, you know how in the good book it says cleanliness is next to godliness, so you better clean your life up. Or, or when God closes one door, he, what, opens another, just like it says in the good book. Right? Obviously, you've heard that one, which just to be clear, none of these things are actually in the Bible. And so we'd love for you to join us as we look to gain clarity about what the scriptures really say, what God really says about life and about how we move through struggles together. Maybe you're here and you've got lots of, lots of questions and you're still processing through doubts. Let me just say this. If you're still trying to figure this out, I am so glad that you are here. And we want this to be a place where people can ask questions, explore their doubts, there have been times in my life when I've wondered whether any of this is really true. And I am so grateful to have been a part of churches that made room for those doubts. And uh, just to let you know, there's a little section in your worship guide that, uh, where I've listed just a few of the reasons why, for me, I have growing confidence that the resurrection of Jesus is an actual historical event. And I'd encourage you to read through that. There's some resources at the bottom. Don't read through it right now during the sermon. <laughs> but later on, it... Sizzler, or wherever you're going to brunch today. <laughs> Real quick, one of the most compelling reasons, at least for me, is that women were the first witnesses of the resurrection. In the first century, if you committed a crime and there were a hundred women who saw you do it, but not a single man, you would walk free. Because in the first century, women were considered of such low social status that they were uh, incapable of being reliable witnesses. That was the thought of that day. So if you're making up some story, there is no way that you would put women there first, which all four gospel writers do. One of these women uh, was Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, whose you know, background check was always getting rejected because of her checkered past, possessed by demons, will get you flagged every single time. Okay, point being, this was about the least likely candidate in all of the New Testament to be the first witness of the empty tomb. Best possible explanation for why women, why Mary Magdalene was described as finding the empty tomb, is that's how it happened. 
and they could not bring themselves to alter the true story. So this is not just good news. It is true news. And if it's true, then we have nothing to fear. All of our fears were defeated. Not that they no longer exist. But what the empty tomb announces is that fear doesn't get the last word. Those fears don't have any power over us because God has shown us that he can take all those fears and use them for good. The empty tomb shows us that God takes death and defeats it by raising Jesus from the dead in the same way he's going to do for us. Easter announces that that God has defeated suffering because Jesus absorbed the worst pain this world has to offer. And now we know that when we suffer, he suffered first on our behalf and he suffers with us and he is our comforter and our help. In the empty tomb, we see that God used what looked like ultimate shame, ultimate failure, his own son dying on a wooden cross, and God transformed that into victory so that we are forgiven, we are washed clean, and we will live forever as sons and daughters of the king. Therefore, there is nothing to fear because the tomb is empty. Fear does not get the last word. Now, Some of you who've been paying attention uh, might be thinking, wait a second, that is so not what I heard in that scripture that was read for us just a few moments earlier. In fact, some of you, when we got to the end of the scripture reading, you were like, huh, that's it? Like, there's got to be more to it. The reader must have gotten it wrong. Look at this again, verse 8, the last words in Mark's gospel, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. End of gospel. So isn't fear like the actual last word? Now, some of you who brought your own Bibles and uh, you were reading along or you have your pew Bible open and when we got to verse 8, you're like, hold on, my Bible keeps going. What about verses 9 through 20? Well, here's the bonus part of the Easter sermon. The Sunrise crew didn't get this. <laughs> if you have a newish Bible in just about every modern translation, verses 9 through 20 in Mark 16 are in italics, or there's a bold heading above it that says, most manuscripts end at verse 8. And the overwhelming majority of scholars believe the authentic ending of Mark's gospel was verse 8, not verses 9 through 20. And I'll try to show you why. You ever watched a movie or binge watched a TV series and you get to the very end, the last episode, the you know, series finale, and it's like a total bummer. Like it's a terrible ending and you're like, why did I just wasted a week of my life rewatching Friends and that was the worst ending ever or whatever it is. One of my favorite examples of this uh, is from the classic movie Princess Bride. And if you've seen this, you'll know that uh, The little boy is homesick, and his granddad comes over to read to him this story. And the grandpa, Columbo, um, (laughs) he's reading along the story, and he suddenly stops reading on, like, the second-to-last page of the book. And in this moment, his grandson, Fred Savage, is like, wait a second, grandpa, that, that can't be how it ends. And Columbo, if you've seen this, says to him, says back to him, well, I thought you didn't like any of that romantic kissy stuff. And young Fred Savage kind of bashfully says, well, maybe I like some of the kissy stuff after all. And so Grandpa opens the book back up and he finishes with the last paragraph. And you may remember this incredible line. Since the invention of the kiss, there have been five kisses rated the most passionate, but this one left them all behind. And you're like, yes, that's how the story is supposed to end. And it's kind of that way when you read through Mark's gospel. And so it's because of that, that that this longing for things to be resolved, that later manuscript copiers, because you didn't have the printing press or digital versions, every single version of the Bible had to be written by hand. And, And there were some people who were transcribing and reading, later Christians, and they got to this abrupt ending and they were like, what? How can it end in fear? That's a terrible ending. And so what they did is they started making up better versions of the ending that they thought were more resolved. And that's what you have with verses 9 through 20. Does that make sense? Later Christians were trying to resolve the tension that Mark creates with the ending of his gospel. And so the question remains, how could Mark's ending, his Easter story, end in fear? 
Like the last word is literally, they were afraid. Well, I'll tell you why I love this ending. Part of it is, is that it's just so real. Like it doesn't try to airbrush over the real life dynamics or, or resolve this reality that these fears are still there. That just because Jesus conquered death doesn't mean that our lives are suddenly void of anything we could ever be afraid of again. I mean, think about all that we have been, to get, been through together collectively over these last couple years. A global pandemic, so many lives lost, so many people sick and hurting and in hospitals, racial tensions, families torn apart by all this hate and division and vitriol, and now this senseless war in Ukraine. And that's not to mention just the, the, the everyday struggles with sickness, loneliness, despair. And see, Mark's gospel doesn't gloss over any of that. But I think even more than that, the reason I'm drawn to this ending is it's as if for Mark, the real ending to this gospel story is what we choose to do in response to the empty tomb. It is almost like Mark and the Spirit of God through the gospel writer Mark is saying to the first listeners of this story and all the way through history to those of us who are listening today, Mark says, I know how the story ends. I've seen it in the courage and the faith of these three women who would overcome their fear and they would go out and they would tell the story of what they've seen in the empty tomb and they would become pillars of this movement that became the church and they risked everything because they had met the risen Christ. They would leave everything behind. They would lose their families. Many of them would lose their lives because what seemed like silence as those women fled the tomb was actually the start of a revolution. And I'll close with this. In 2004, during the elections in Ukraine, there was a reformer by the name of Viktor Yashchenko who challenged the establishment party. And as some of you may remember, it's a pretty fascinating story. He was actually poisoned in the lead up to the election and nearly died, but he survived. Well, on election day, all the exit polls uh, showed that Yashchenko had this huge lead. It was an insurmountable lead. He was going to win by a landslide. But through blatant fraud, the government in power reversed the results. Well, that evening, the state-run TV network uh, reported that Yushchenko had lost. But there was this one thing they hadn't thought about, they didn't take into account. That's a true story. In the lower right-hand corner of the state-run TV network TV screen that everybody in Ukraine was watching was this brave woman who was doing sign language translation of the news, real time. And during the broadcast, as they were announcing that Yashchenko had lost and the, uh, the establishment party had won, she starts to sign, don't believe it. They're lying. Not true. Yashchenko is our president. Well, no one in the studio of the state-run TV network knew what she was doing. They didn't understand sign language. They just assumed that she's doing what she's supposed to do, following along. But deaf people all over Ukraine started texting their friends. And their friends started texting their friends and spreading the word. And soon journalists got courageous. And eventually a million people poured into the streets. And the government finally caved in and Yashchenko became the president. What seemed like silence was actually the start of a revolution. Okay, that's Easter. What seemed between Friday and Sunday morning, like silence, something happened that caused this band of defeated quitters who ran in fear when Jesus was arrested and killed. Something happened in that empty tomb that these three women and later on those same washed out disciples would launch a movement that would change history. People overcome with fears were somehow changed almost overnight into women and men of unthinkable courage because the tomb was empty. They would stare at death, what once sent them running in fear and they would live with such boldness, such hope, such unflinching power and joy, they stopped trembling in fear and they started running in joy to tell the story of the empty tomb and the world has never been the same. Because they knew the one who had said, who had come to them and said, I love you and, and I'm calling you and I've chosen you and I'm going to fight for you. And even when you turn your back on me and reject me and deny me, I'm going to come back again for you and I will overcome whatever it takes, even the grave, to win you back to me. So how about you? 
And maybe some of you here today are ready to say, fear doesn't have to have the last word in my story anymore. I want the risen Jesus, his forgiveness, his grace, his love for me to be the beginning and the ending of my story. And I know we don't do this very often, we frozen, chosen Presbyterians, but sometimes there is just power in acknowledging when God moves in us and changes us. And I wonder if for some of you, when you think back over the last year or couple years and all we've been through together, that something happened, something changed, and Jesus became the center of your story. His love, his forgiveness, his presence have become more real to you than at any other point in your life. Maybe you're a confirmation student, or maybe you grew up in a church, or you were baptized way back when, but it's like something happened in this season of life that after a time of kind of keeping God at a distance, Jesus has become a part of your story. And if that's true for you, whether it's something that, that is happening for the first time, as, as we've invited so many people all day through all of our gatherings to, to stand up, and so many have, or you might just feel like something has changed in my life in recent days or months or years because of Jesus, and honestly, what I need, I need like an anniversary. Like on Easter Sunday, I'll never forget, I will always remember that that was the moment, the day that I stood up and I let people know Jesus has changed my life and I will never be the same and I have put my trust in him. And if that's true for you, whether you're in Elliott Hall or you're joining us here in the sanctuary, I want to ask, like right now in this place, would you be willing to stand so that we can celebrate you on Easter and what Jesus has done in your life? Would you be willing to stand right now? Yes. Thank you, thank you. So let's pray together. King Jesus, we thank you that you are still bringing dead stuff back to life. We thank you, Jesus, for coming for us to, to wash us clean, to forgive us, to make us new. And we thank you that even when we turn from you or walk away from you or whatever we're carrying in our past behind us, mistakes, regrets, failures, God, we thank you that you continue to overcome whatever we face or whatever we've done to win us back to you. And I thank you that there are some people here today whose lives and whose eternity are now different because you are the center of their story. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to do that work in us, even as we lift high the cross in this room and then as we go from this place to lift high your cross and how we live and love and sacrifice and serve this world. And we pray this in Jesus' name and everybody said together, amen. <laughs>
is risen. He is risen Amen. It's been great to be able to worship with you today and glad that you are here. I want to call your attention to two quick things. If you have any questions about what it means to follow Jesus Christ, any questions at all, please come see me or any of our ministry leaders and we'll be glad to talk to you about that. And remember, Alpha is coming up in May and it's a great place to have questions answered about faith. Also, next Sunday, immediately following the 11 a.m. service, there'll be a, a lunch on the lawn. So wear flats next week and uh, make sure you're comfortable and, and please join us for the lunch on the lawn next Sunday. Now, before the choir sings the Hallelujah Chorus, uh, the choral benediction over us, receive this benediction. May the power of God used to raise Jesus from the grave be also at work in you today and always to God's glory and your good. Amen. Thank you.